I'm George Galloway, and I present Kale Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kale Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kale Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kale Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television. Coming to you from London, but discussing something that can truly be said to be a global phenomenon. That's right, football. My great grandfathers invented it, or ours did, here in Britain. And it may be our greatest invention of them all. We have exported it to every corner of the planet, every man, woman, and child knows the big global football superstars. My three-year-old daughter has a view on whether Messi or Ronaldo are the greatest. We're all Ronaldo people, let me tell you. Now, it would be normal for some of you to think, well, I'm not that interested in football, and therefore is this program for me? But it is, because the story that has recently broken about the secret plans by the world's biggest and richest clubs to break away from all of the others in the interests of the bottom line, in the interests of the green folding stuff, tells us a lot about the late stage capitalism in which we are living and tells us also how dispensable all of the rest of us are, led like sheep if we will, into the pen to cough up still more money for the richest oligarchs who increasingly own the biggest clubs. Sometimes even countries owning football clubs in other people's countries. If that's not pregnant with problems, let me tell you this, that the rulers of Saudi Arabia, the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman himself, is currently trying to buy an English Premier League football club. And the government doesn't know whether to stop him or not. So it's high politics, high finance and football. So stay tuned. The plan was egregious, without any question of a doubt. That's why it died within 48, maybe 72 hours. The shortest lived breakaway in history. But the forces which propelled that breakaway continue to exist. Once upon a time, when my great-grandfathers invented this wonderful, beautiful game, it was a working man's sport. There weren't many women then going to the games and still fewer playing it. Now it's a game for everyone, men and women from all over the world. And... Allegiance is still a thing. I once told the then chairman of Celtic Football Club, when I was the chairman of the Celtic Supporters Club in the House of Commons in Parliament in London, he came down to speak to us, and throughout his address, he described us as customers. I pointed out to them that customers we were not. A customer has a choice whether to shop in your supermarket or another. We are in your supermarket, I said to him, because our fathers were and our grandfathers were. And even if the stuff on your shelves stink to high heaven, we'll still have to go to your supermarket and would not dream of crossing the road to find another one. That mentality still drives football. It is the mentality which has scores of thousands of people coming to a single game, no matter how badly their team is living, uh, working and playing. It's the same mentality uh, that drives us onto the uh, internet to buy exorbitantly priced merchandise for all of our children. I have six children. I wouldn't like to calculate how much money I've spent in the club shop. And it's the mentality that drives us to buy Sky TV and BT and Eurosport and other subscriptions because 
quite frankly, we are hooked on the game of football. I'm joined here, as always, by a team of this time unusually distinguished excellence and experience to discuss has money murdered football. <laughs> I'm joined by my good friend. I'm so old that I remember him as one of the most exciting players in the English First Division, playing for Manchester City long before uh, the Sheikh of Arabi uh, bought it over. He was dazzling. He was a messy of his day and still looks like he could play today. He was a top footballer. He's now a top football agent, which means it's his job to get even more money for the highest paid professional footballers. His name is Barry Silkman, and he's my first up today. Barry, I'm thinking you know the game, you love the game, you know why we love the game, but on the other hand, your job is to get the last uh, pound, shillings and pence for your clients. Where did you stand on the European Super League? I mean, I know they've been talking about it for years, George. I knew about it four or five years ago. It was a question of whether it was ever going to happen. What I think has not come across is how they wanted to do it. It's got cut off before they ever got there. I think it'll happen one day. Not quite sure when now. Maybe not the next four or five years, but I'm sure it'll happen. How it was put across by the media... You couldn't have it. It was impossible to have it. The supporters jumped on it. The media jumped on it. In reality, how it would have been is not how it was portrayed. Well, that's a gigantic failure of communication strategy from, from mega corporations run by uh, some of the richest people on the planet. D did it not occur to them to hire a public relations man? Well, I was waiting for the call, George. I think they just thought, well, he's only an agent. <laughs> uh, I tell you what I think hasn't come across here. You know, if this would have happened, the money that clubs would have got is, I mean, we're not talking about hundreds of millions. We're talking beyond hundreds of millions, including merchandise. Each club would have had, I would have said, at least a billion a year, if not more. They could have bought another team. So in effect, they could have had... It, now you've got 25 players in a squad. The reality is, in most clubs, only 16 or 17 of them are actual first-team starters, yeah? The rest are what I would call bit-part players. In actors, they're bit-part actors. They're in the background all the time, yeah? What this money would have done it would have allowed those clubs to have 2022 first team regular players, which if you like, in the, in the words of a bag of sweets, it could have been mix and match. So you may have got, had because it would have been a midweek league. So you'd have got maybe 11 players playing in that midweek. And then when it comes to a Saturday or Sunday game, maybe only seven of them would have taken part, maybe six. But the four or five who would have come in, trust me, would be just as good as the four or five going out. And I think that was the communication that went missing. People started saying, well, we're going to have a reserve players from these teams. How can our club do this? Because if we're playing on a, on a Wednesday, as an example, in Europe, how can we play on a Friday night? It's physically not possible, yeah? I don't think it was communicated right, or if you like, I'm not even sure it was thought out right by the clubs in the beginning. I don't really think they even thought about it themselves. I think they just looked at the finances over the last four or five years. Because as football, as you know, when I played, it was 80% sport, 20% finance. Yeah, that's what football was. It's now 80% finance, 20% sport. And yet the finance depends on the sport. I mean, if the, if, if, if the game is... If people fall out of love with the game, the finance will go down the... Eventually, tube. yeah. Eventually, yeah. But would you fall out? I'll give you an example. You made an example before of me. 
I was a little bit like a Lionel Messi type. You were, you were. Okay. So let's just say I'm playing on a Saturday for the club that you love. Yeah? Yeah. You love Man United. You're a Man United supporter. Okay. So let's just say you've got Marcus Rashford, one of those players, Paul Pogba, playing, and you're watching them on a Saturday. But in midweek, they're replaced by Eric Cantona because he's there. You, would you be concerned with that situation? Well, you're getting me excited, actually. Exactly. The very uh, and possibility. Think, and I think this was the problem. I don't think that the clubs, they went at it like a bull at a China gate. I think what they should have done is just sell down and explained what the rationale was and what the thinking behind it. Instead of all saying, yeah, we'll sign up to this, there was no explanation. And as a supporter, and if you're outside the game, which supporters are, most of them, you go, hold on a minute, what are you talking about? Like, how can you do this? You're walking away from the Premier League. Everyone thought they were just walking away from the Premier League. So I don't think the reality of the situation, George, was put across at all, let alone not put across well. I don't think it was put yeah. across at all. No, Ahmed Caballo could have made it on the football pitch and in the boxing ring. I wanted to be his manager in the latter case. But he concentrated on being now one of Britain's best up-and-coming investigative reporters. But I'm asking him to wear both hats in this programme. Ahmed, like me, you love Manchester United. We are owned by American oligarchs who don't even know the shape of a football, who have never met an angry football supporter, uh, who have none of the love of the club that we do. But they are our owners. And they just proved that they could actually do with what we love entirely as they please. How did that make you feel? It made me feel angry. But what made me feel especially angry is we've been protesting against the Glazers since 2005. I was at the first protest at a Champions League game against AC Milan. I then went to more protests in 2010. Where was the solidarity from the FA, from the rest of the clubs, when these owners took over Manchester United, saddled the club with £750 million worth of debt? The club still today has £550 million worth of debt. Of course, they were always going to do something like this down the line. The writing was on the wall. There needed to be some sort of... Boris Johnson said he was going to drop a legislative bomb to stop this. There needed to be a legislative bomb back in 2005 to stop not just the takeover of Manchester United, but of Arsenal. I know Manchester City and Chelsea are a little bit different because you could argue, well, you could definitely argue that both of those clubs have benefited from the foreign investments. But they were saved by, uh, yeah, by but, but a, that, a Russian... Uh, Abramovich and by His Royal Highness the uh, uh, the uh, the Prince of, of uh, United Arab Emirates. You could say that that worked. Yeah, but it didn't work with Manchester United. It was already a successful football club. We'd already won the Champions League, and it was okay when we had Sir Alex Ferguson, who was a genius, possibly the greatest manager to ever live. But as soon as he left the cracks started to unveil. We didn't see the investment that we needed. We sold Cristiano Ronaldo for 80 million. That money wasn't reinvested back into the club. We see that Jose Mourinho wanted a fullback, but he was denied it because they weren't investing into the club how they should. So, so for me, I'm just happy that now other clubs are angry and now we can really get to the bottom of the crux of the, of the issue, which is the style of ownership here in the UK. We need to move towards in fact, that's what some Manchester United supporters group are doing now. Move towards the German style, where the fans have greater ownership. You, your whole life, have campaigned for the national rail to be um, nationalised and things that matter to the public to be in the hands of the public. Well, what matters to the public more than their football club, their local football club, where they spend all of their money for their children to be dressed from top to bottom? I used to go from 13 years of age, from Birmingham to Old Trafford, all around the country to support my club. I wasn't... I, was, I wouldn't spend my money in the, in, the, in, the, in the school shop. I'd save it to go because it means so much. And you mentioned that I'm a journalist by trade. I obviously focus on politics, but my first love was football. The first time I picked up a newspaper, it was to turn to the back pages, <laughs> not to the front. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, now, uh, the uh, expert here, who is not a footballer, 
but is a football analyst and a football YouTuber. Uh, supreme, actually. And I'm sorry, Barry, but he's yet another Manchester United fan. He is Amir Hassan Razvi. Uh, he is, as I say, an active supporter, but he's also an activist. Ahmed paints a picture there that this anger is going to produce fundamental change in ownership. Do you believe that? That is the hope. That is the desire. Um, none of us Manchester United fans wanted the Glazers there in the first place. As um, my friend over there has put it in such good terms, they did saddle us with all this debt. Um, we didn't want it. We were a successful club in the 113 years of history when they took over. Manchester United never had any debt. And all of a sudden, we had this, this bomb dropped on us. They actually bought the club... On debt. ...on our money. Absolutely. Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. It's like me buying your house, but forcing you to pay Absolutely. me to buy it. And then keeping the debt on my name and not on your name. Yes. So if anything does happen, yes. you're scot-free. Yes. The club will then um, you know, disappear and sure. vanish. Um, so, yeah, none of us are happy with the Glazers. We've all wanted them out since they got there because of the fact that there's not, not, not been any investment. If we look at it like when Salix Ferguson was there, for example, like he's pointed out, his genius alone kept the Glazers afloat. And then we had David Moyes, LVG, Jose Mourinho, all with different ideas, all needing investment, all needing backing, and then we saw what exactly happened. That's the investment side of it. Then you have the um, dividend side that the Glazers have taken out. Over the last um, 16 years of their ownership, they've taken out 1.5 billion dollars of dividends alone. Even if they put maybe a quarter of that into investment of the team, the team would be in a different place now. And then also the stadium itself, that is diminishing. That needs to be redone. There's, you know, parts of the stadium are leaking. There's um, it needs more than a lick of paint outside the stadium. So everything you see on TV when, when obviously the fans were in, is all smoke and, mirror, smoke and mirrors. You'd see all the, all the lights and, you know, bright lights, you see the Manchester United sign, you see the Salix Ferguson stand. But if you look a little bit deeper, there's cracks everywhere. And these um, parasites, if you will, um, they, they need to leave. But these parasites uh, have the power. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's why um, there needs to be legislation from government. There needs to be legislation from the FA. There needs to be some sort of political intervention that comes in that would enable fans to have more of a say in major decisions that take place at any of the clubs. And especially the six most you know, powerful clubs, if you will. That's where, that's where they, they need more fan intervention. Because once you give a billionaire free reign over stuff, you know, they're crazy anyway. Well, let's get out of Manchester and go to Barcelona, where my colleague RT and longtime friend Luis Castro is. Let's hear the view from Barcelona. Uh, hello, George. Well, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure talking to you, as usual. Luis, tell us exactly what happened and why. Well, here in Spain, uh, the president of Real Madrid and president of this Super League gave a very long interview for the first time because he doesn't normally give interview. He explained or was trying to explain what is behind it. And to be honest, I pay attention for the whole half, one an hour and a half. And ironically, it started to make sense what he was actually saying. I know it sounds strange because what everybody is jumping quickly to say is that this is the rich clubs trying to get richer. At the same time, we are listening to the argument fairly brought by the fans and by the clubs, but also in the end brought up by UEFA and FIFA. Even Florentino Perry was saying is that they are only against it because they are out of it. That's the problem. They, they're not in the big money. In, in the United Kingdom, for instance, we should all remember what happened when the United Kingdom lost the, um, the right to have the World Cup in favor of both of Russia and Qatar. We were all saying that FIFA is corrupted, the FIFA is just paying money behind, but under the desk, behind doors, et cetera, et cetera. So we forgot about that. Do we really think that FIFA and UEFA care about football? But what they're saying is basically, especially because of this crisis with the COVID-19, most of the teams, if not the whole world of football, is in a deep economic crisis. His argument is that more than half, half of the population of the world 
is a fan of Real Madrid, Barcelona, Manchester United, Liverpool, uh, Bayern Munich, PSG, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they, if these teams are not sustainable, to use a common world these days, the whole world of football will collapse. Some people believe that greed has gone too far in football. What's your take on that? Well, yeah, football has become uh, very expensive and precisely the, the thing that it, is making me a little bit like wary about the whole situation is the fact that you see big money like JP Morgan behind all of this. Uh, the bank uh, is the main financer of the Super League. And in the last past, well, probably in the 21st century, we have seen since uh, the times of Roman Abramovich when he came to Chelsea, how big millionaires are taking over clubs, big clubs like Liverpool, Manchester United, PSG, etc., Manchester City. So the question that we should have been asking back then is like, are these people really interested in football or just money? So the same question that they are trying to tell the Super League or they are complaining about the super, the idea of a Super League these days, it's the same one we should have asked back then, when we saw all these people that don't belong to the world of football taking over clubs and just, well, managing everything as, as a cash point, to say the least. Luis, lucky you, you're in Barcelona now. What's the Spanish people's reaction been to the Super League fiasco? Well, the people here in Spain, uh, in the media, obviously, they all went crazy and they were completely against it. But then you just need to see who pays to see who is telling you what. For instance, the, uh, the Marca newspaper, one of the main ones in sports here in Spain, is owned by the owner of the club Torino in Italy. Torino is the biggest rival of Juventus. So, of course... He's not going to say anything in favor of the Super League because Juventus is on it. Even in Catalonia, the Barcelona um, newspaper were against it. Everybody was against it. There was absolutely nobody other than Florentino Perez in favor of the Super League. But it is, it is, it is a very strange uh, situation, the fact that you should actually listen to someone like him, a millionaire with multiple enterprises, very successful in the world of football because he's taken Real Madrid to almost more than five to six European titles since he is president. But I, I, I blame it a little bit in the lack of information and nevertheless to the fact that, well, this is just a project. It's not even running. So not even the, clear, the rules are clear about who was going to be on it and what would it be the procedure or who will it be on it. Finally, do you think we'll ever see some version at least of this Super League idea? emerge again? Well, uh, this contract is still uh, like bind by law and Florentino Perez has been saying, well, they can say whatever, but the, they are not out of the league. Everybody will be out when they pay their, their penalties and the compensation money that they signed for. So, so far, apparently, legally, if we go to the world of law, the, 12, the Super League is still on because uh, they have a contract that they either will have to... Um, apply or they will have to come out and then, I don't know, pay a penalty, I suppose. Much more of that after the break. Stay tuned. You're watching Kale Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maedin Television. Coming to you from London, but talking about a truly global issue the future of football, and in particular, has money murdered football? Barry Silkman, uh, the point that was made by Ahmed and by Luis in Barcelona uh, is worth dealing with. There's a lot of hypocrisy here. If you are the owner of Torino, uh, you're jumping mad about this idea because your rival, Juventus in the same city, uh, is in it, and you're not. If you are working as a pundit for Sky, uh, which has a very clear material advantage in not having to shell out for payment of Super League games, uh, you're going to be uh, allowed free reign to be against it. No doubt, of course, the pundits are against it genuinely, but if the owner of the television station thought otherwise, 
they wouldn't be given that platform. In other words, the big H, hypocrisy, it's present in this, isn't it? Oh, no, absolutely. But also, George, what you've got to look at is if they dropped out the league, let's just say for a minute, they all dropped out the league and they weren't in this league. They weren't in the Premier League. They went into their own league. A major problem occurs. The biggest problem is that football, the Premier League clubs, would all be history. Every single one of them. You know why? Because they all have players under contracts, two, three, four, five years, whatever the length of the contract. That contract can't be changed unless a player agrees to it. A contract is a contract. And if Sky Television lose the top six clubs, there is not a chance they would carry on paying the money that they pay to each club, OK? So they're not going to pay it. They will cut the money in half. What happens then? What happens to the players' contracts? Either players are then going to have to say, I'm willing to take the 50 or 60% pay cut, or they'll all go bankrupt. And if, if the club in writing, which is very interesting, offer a player less money than he is already on, that player automatically becomes a free transfer. So this is a lot. Yeah, let me Incredible. ask you about that, Barry. I love you, but I've got to put this bluntly to you. Aren't people like you partly to blame for this situation? All you're, me, George, all me. <laughs> you're, a, you're, you're a football agent. Uh, it's the ever upward pressure on players' wages that contributes to this situation. Alfie Halland, aged 20, is currently, you're not his agent, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, uh, is currently demanding one million pound a week to sign for one of these big six clubs. That's your fault as an agent. I'm not his agent. You just said to me, I'm not his agent. Now you're blaming me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, what you read in the paper a player is demanding in reality is not sometimes fact, yeah? You'll only get for your client what a club is willing to give. And this is very interesting. I had an owner, chairman of a football club that I, be, I speak to a lot. And only two days ago, he called me and asked me a question. He's got a player there and... He has an agent who happens to be, I won't say who the agent is, other than one of his family. So you can take agent out of the equation. And he's asked for the most unbelievable amount of salary you could ever imagine. And the owner phoned me and said, Silky, you're close with Man United and with Man City still, aren't you? I said, yeah, very close. He said, find out if he was at their clubs what sort of salary they would give. And I spoke to the top person at Man City and I spoke to the top person at Man United. In fact, I left him a message, Man United, come back to me within hours. Neither of them would pay anywhere near what this player is demanding for several reasons. And the main reason is where we are in the world today. The money's not there, George. The club's... You know, as Manchester United told me, Real Madrid, Barcelona, the two Milan clubs, Juve, they're all skint. Everyone's skint. The chairman that I spoke to, there's no money. They can buy it. The, the manager of this club, and the club are doing very well this year, very, very well. Ideally, he needs four players to maybe really push him into a, another world, if you like. They can afford one striker, provided he's not more than 25 million. Now, go back two years ago, a terrific striker would have cost you 50, 60, 70. You might actually pick one up for 25 or 30. And the salaries are going the same way. So you can ask what you like. The reality is they'll only give you what they want to give you. How so fascinating. It, 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 so we'll talk off here about some of these matters, I hope. Ahmed, the bottom line for us, you and me, with our politics, is democracy, isn't it? That this is a vital part of our lives. 
over which we can exercise no control whatsoever. We can elect our councillor, who might be our landlord. We can elect our parliament, which can pass laws and so on. But in this vital part of our lives, and trust me, as you get older, it doesn't get any easier. You're, you're more and more hooked on football. It's never going to change some. Uh, we can exercise no control. We can't decide who owns us. We can't decide what they do, where they go. Uh, so the bottom line for us has got to be democratic control, like they've got in German football. It's no accident that the Germans, Bayern Munich, Leipzig and so on, that they did not join this European Super League because they couldn't get it past their supporters. And the supporters own the club. That's got to be the way forward, doesn't it? It does have to be the way forward, but I think it's even bigger than democracy. It's about the very essence of sport, which is merit. The reason why I enjoy, why I put aside my Wednesday nights to watch the Champions League is because if we go out the Champions League and we don't make top four, then we're not in the Champions League next season. It matters. Football matters. When you go with your son to watch him on, on a Sunday, it matters if he wins or loses. We don't want to go into a situation where this Americanized model of franchise football, where the teams are there, they can't be removed. And the reason why Manchester United is despised at the moment is because of our history of success. There's nothing actually about the football club you can despise. We rose out of the ashes of the Munich disaster to win the, the, the first English team to win the Champions League. But if we were to go into a Super League where we couldn't be relegated, where other teams couldn't join because they don't have the same history, then every football fan in the country would have every reason to really hate us, for, um, and, and not just us, the other five clubs that would join us. So it's about merit, and it's about the fact that Manchester City were in League One or the Championship a few years ago. Now they're winning the league. They could go on to win the Champions League. That is the beauty of a sport. So, it's, so don't ruin the thing that me, you, and everyone in this room, I, I presume, loves, and, and our children after us will continue to love. I mean, the, uh, the situation is now unclear. The Super League has crashed and burned. But the forces that propelled it into almost existence continue to exist. You're an analyst. What are you expecting to happen next? Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't be so sure that the Super League is fully dead and buried because the Super League, they say, is suspended. Barcelona, Real Madrid um, and Juventus still are clinging to something. I'm not entirely sure what they're clinging to, but they're clinging to something. So... Let's go with the premise that because there's not enough numbers of teams there, the Super League is dead and buried. That can only be a good thing because, um, like it's been pointed out, you can't have a closed system of a league, especially where you're guaranteed to get into it regardless of where you finish in your predominant league. So in this case, the Premier League, the top six that chose to go in the European Super League, they could realistically end 10th to 16th and they would still be in it. There's no merit based on that. And then, and then the other point I'd to add to that is that, um, like Barry pointed out, is that he said that there would be two sets of teams, hypothetically, one for the Champions League, one for the European Super League. But realistically, we've seen with the Glazers, they don't like to invest. So if you can get into the Super League without investing and you can still get the money, why would you invest? It makes no sense. So your, your Premier League team would be your reserves, would be your youth players. It would be effectively be the Carabao Cup for uh, Manchester United on a weekly basis. How am I going to translate the Carabao Cup for an international uh, <laughs> audience? That's, uh, that's a tricky one. Let's go to uh, Dr J. Simon Rofe, who's in London, but who's the author of several books, including Sport and Diplomacy. He's at the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy, and he's a reader at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Dr. Rove, let me start from the very beginning, the premise of the show. Has money murdered football? Well, it's a poignant question, particularly in the week of the you know, birth and demise of the European Super League. Um, football has been slowly chipping away um, like the drip of a, a leaky tap um, uh, the relationship with money um, has been corroding uh, football for almost as long as football's existed. 
um, the first owners of football clubs as they emerged in the late 19th century in uh, the, the twin in the United Kingdom were you know local businessmen people who sought out um, the opportunity to leverage their power and wealth relative power and wealth uh, in their locale um, through you know the labor um, the physical uh, exercise and labor of local individuals players to be part of uh, a discussion um, a discourse around sport uh, and that discussion discourse played out on a field uh, it's not a, an intellectual one but one of physical exertion where the risks were high you know injury on a football pitch could have uh, ended a not only a playing career but a working career mm -hmm. these were largely working class very much largely working class uh, players who were part of a, uh, a system if you like and that system lasted through large parts of the 20th century particularly in the British model um, betrothed to clubs registrations uh, minimum wages uh, all of the sorry maximum wages all of these kinds of things were key parts of the football architecture underpinned by relative money the zeros on the end of the checks have got a lot bigger uh, and this week, the sort of gargantuan amounts of money that are being talked about, billions uh, of dollars, pounds, yens, euros, all of the, these um, you know, currencies have important constituent parts in understanding how football and business and money and finance and commerce play out together. And that's really what we've seen, you know, come to fruition um, in you know, the, the experience, the sort of mad 72 hours of uh, the European Super League. Do you believe that greed has gone too far in football? Well, I think there's two things there. One is that the greed has always been there. And again, it's perhaps a familiar trope, but it's the greed of who? The greed of the owners, the greed of the players, the greed of the agents, the greed of the fans. You know, what is the, the currency might be, and for some, the owners might be money. For fans, it might be trophies. We're all, in, in that sense, football fans are greedy uh, in a way that um, football owners, you know, can relate to, they can e e exploit because you can pay a lot of money to see your team win and winning doesn't just come on the bank balance. Winning comes as a part of being part of a community, sharing an experience that those values football fans would find perhaps difficult um, to, you know, put a monetary value against doesn't mean they're not valuable. It just means the zeros at the end of it are different. And that is, you know, the, the opportunity to share a, a winning goal with your son or your father at the last minute of a cup final. Those kind of experiences are, you know, this is where the word priceless comes from in, in some senses. You know, uh, a certain brand of um, credit card used that, you know, the experience is priceless. And these are the kinds of equations that, you know, don't play out on, you know, uh, bank sheet, uh, bank balance sheets. They play out in the hearts and minds, societies and communities that impact uh, football. Are football clubs genuinely run in the interest of the fan and the interests of the sport? Well, again, it depends fairly for who, you know, fairly for the shareholders, fairly for the owners, fairly for uh, access to, you know, issues of diversity and inclusion, fairness to the, the fans and players. What football clubs represent is many different stakeholders uh, in society. And those different stakeholders have different senses of fair play, different senses of who, what are the rules of the game. But all of these are continually up for negotiation. You know, if you're playing a, a pickup game of football in the park, you know, there's the negotiation about where's the boundary line? Is it the tree or is it the, the wall? You know, there's a, there's a negotiation about whether it's first to 10 or next goal wins. You know, sport gives you those those opportunities. So when you say, is it is it fair? We need to really think about who is it fair for. And we do end up in a scenario there where you end up with the, the, the tyranny of the majority. You know, actually, it can't be fair for everyone. Sport has an inherent quality, as, as George Orwell said. Someone has to lose. You know, that the uncertainty of outcome is what's integral to sport. If we always know that your Real Madrid's or your Manchester United's are going to win, it loses its appeal. And that was one of the fundamental criticisms of the European Super League. You know, because you don't have any consequence to losing, 
the risk isn't there. There can only be one winner in, in you know, the, the FA Cup, the hundreds of teams that join every August, there's only ever one winner. That means there's 900 plus teams who lose. You know, some of them can lose gloriously. Some of them can lose, you know, having made some financial gain along the way. Some of them can lose having, you know, indulged in, in glory of, 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 a, of a game against a, a, a giant uh, or, you know, some ignominy of losing to a, a minnow. But there's, there's a narrative to that. And that speaks again to the importance that football plays in society about storytelling, about providing common uh, spaces for communities, individuals to come together, even if they don't physically come together, as we're not at the moment. But, you know, we recognise that there is a, a common uh, you know, narrative to, you know, watching a football match, as there is indeed to other sporting occasions. Dr. Rove, would the creation of such a Super League ever bring any good to the game? Well, the issues that the Super League raised are still live, even if the current manifestation of it has you know, temporarily or um, perhaps more temporarily passed. The issue of debt in football, the issue of who owns media rights, the issue of who needs to be inside the stadium, the issue of who the stakeholders are, who governs and regulates football. Is it the fans? Is it the government? Is it UEFA? Is it FIFA? Or is it the owners? All of these different constituents make up the football community. Some have more agency, some have more leverage than others. And I think it's the good that could come from it is if we are able to reappraise the regimes in which football clubs operate. Who are the stakeholders? Can you do uh, an upgrade, as it were, to the fit and proper person test? You know? Those who, who qualifies to be one of the stakeholders, and particularly in terms of ownership, the, the significant stakeholder. It's not to say they can ride roughshod over everything, but you know, they do have, in some senses, shareholders to appease. So these are considerations. What's in the best interest of the shareholders may not be winning a football match. That's a really different, difficult thing to reconcile for... Um, you know, fans, particularly if fans want to win against a local rival in a derby match or in a cup final. But the consequence of those things is financially not as rewarding as finishing in a, uh, you know, a place up in the league or being part of an organisation like the European Super League. So those issues still remain. Finally, Doctor, where is this heading? Well, that's, that's a big question. Um, you know, football requires a greater level of regulation uh, in my opinion um, but I think we also then need to be careful about who are the regulators uh, who provides the governance mechanism to my mind you know independent um, governing bodies are the most useful um, in providing a framework and we see this in other sports whether it's about good governance as a whole safeguarding issues of diversity and inclusion all of these are issues which sport has to tackle as a whole and football in particular. So I think the, there's an incumbency on the Football Association, there's an incumbency on the Premier League, there's an incumbency on players. Um, and I mean that from the grassroots right the way through to the elite players who we see on our screens on, on the weekend. And in each of those instances, there is agency. It was telling how important the players were in providing an opinion. You know, the likes of a, a Jordan Henderson or a Harry Maguire, Patrick Bamford's comments um, to Sky after the game on, on Monday night between uh, Leeds United and Liverpool. All of these provide a focus and a forum. And you know, those players have an audience. Um, and that really is, is something that you know, the, the current iteration of the plan for the European Super League seem to you know, be out of step with. Um, but I don't think we should underestimate the fact that the issues underpinning it the owners aren't going anywhere there. Apologies this week, you know, and again, the degree to which they can be taken seriously, what they do, what can be taken seriously is they're not going anywhere. This hasn't made them think, right, you know, it's time to sell up. It, it, you know, they'll come back with another iteration of this. Their interests dictate it. They haven't become wealthy individuals without thinking cleverly and being resilient. So the, the future of football, you know, it's still very much up for grabs, um, as someone once said. 
almost philosophy that uh, and much to ruminate on it. But Ahmed, this fit and proper person, uh, to own a Premiership Football Club, you have to pass a test that says you are a fit and proper person to own this club. Now, it is rather unequally uh, applied, so fit and proper person is what we ought to be looking for. Haven't these big six owners proved themselves not to be fit and proper persons? Shouldn't they now be forced to divest? Yeah, and that's what the other 14 clubs are pushing for. So the other 14 clubs have come together and have demanded precisely that. And I think what's hurt them the most is time and time again, when they raise their concerns that they thought a Super League was happening, a breakaway league was happening, these six six clubs were basically gaslighting them and saying there's nothing to be worried about, this is all conspiracy theory, you're being paranoid. And long and behold, we find out, but before, before Klopp and, and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer by the looks of it, we find out they have tried to do a breakaway club. So these owners can't be trusted. And as the gentleman said on the screen, they will try this at another point. Barry, why did that, or rather, how did that happen? How did some of the world's biggest clubs turn their back on this. The German, we know, because their fans wouldn't have worn it, but Ajax, for example, uh, a world-famous team in Amsterdam, PSG in Paris. Uh, uh, how did they not go into it, or were they just not asked? I would have presumed, and I, this is guesswork, I would have presumed that they'd had some sort of talks I don't think this was something where somebody went, OK, we'll pick that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. I think, I said to you, George, I knew about this five years ago. So if I knew about it five years ago, it's happened at least five years ago, if not before. So I would say a lot of discussions have taken place between all the clubs, including the two that you mentioned, Ajax and PSG. For whatever reason, they've come to, whether it's by choice or by... Wanting to go into it, not wanting to go into it, they come to the the, the one the, 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 the ones they come to. Just diversing slightly when we talk about supporters owning football clubs, impossible. We spoke about just now about fit and proper people. So what do you do? Get thirty thousand supporters and go and see whether well, they elect fit and a committee. You say impossible. Bayern Munich are one of the greatest teams in Ye the world. Years ago they did it. They did it years ago before football's become what it's become. That's the problem we have, George. The money now in football wasn't there when they did it. Sadly, or good, or whatever. No, it's sadly it's for now. you. Look, I want, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I want to ask you that question. I was really struck, as others will have been, that you negotiated for yourself, or failed to negotiate for yourself, an increase of £100 a week to £150 a week. Now, you are negotiating for other people. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I happen to know fifty and sixty and seventy thousand pound a week. Scary for George. other people. How do you think? How I did feel? that happen? How do, you, how do you think? How do you think I feel? I'm sitting here thinking, hold on a minute. I was desperate to get a hundred quid a week. I'm sitting here. I'm negotiating. This guy's on like. £25,000 a week, which in itself is like a fortune, yeah? And I'm trying to get him up to 50 or 55 with £15,000 appearance money. And I actually sit there, I swear to God, I think, what's going on? I remember sitting with TV and I was struggling. I couldn't get under a quid a week. I'm asking this, this chief executive for this chairman for £25,000, £30,000 a week more. And it is frightening, but it is the world that... And the way that football has gone, it's just how it's gone. Do you know I've lost players by saying to the player who has said to me, try and get me to that club, try and get me to West Ham. And I say, you're not good enough to get in the side. I swear to you, I've lost players because of it. Because I come from a slightly different angle. So when I sit there asking for 20, 30, 40, 50, and in one case, £110,000 a week, in one way, it's great to come out and say to the player, I've got you, you know, you wanted 70, I've got you 90. It's great. On the other side, I actually get a little bit embarrassed by doing it. And I'm only happy to do it 
when I really believe the player's good enough and I know what other players are getting at that club. So in my heart, I'm happy to do it, George. Does that make sense? Yeah, your conscience is yeah, clear. Yeah, completely you know. clear, yeah. Well, look, we, we, we've all got to put bread on the table. You do it by extorting huge sums of money <laughs> from very rich people. Well, I do put a gun to their head, George, sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's not loaded, by the way. <laughs> but they don't know that. <laughs> but I simply couldn't better that for an ending to this show. I told you, if you watched it, that it wasn't just about football. It's a morality tale. After all, one, two, three, different ethnicities, different parts of the country, part of a community of interest behind one football club, in my case, since 1963, on the day that the great Dennis Law signed for Manchester United. My father told me, because I was only nine, we are now Manchester United supporters. And now all of my children are. And some of them you may one day see on the field at Old Trafford. And I hope that Barry Silkman will be their agent. <laughs> it's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. I've been George Galloway. This is Kali Mahora on Al Mayadeen Television. Thank you for watching. <laughs>